Soon, for the first time in history, the majority of the Earth's population will live in cities. Throughout history, God has had a special love for cities and has repeatedly sent his people to seek the good of the city. Understanding the complexity of the city is necessary to achieve the good of the city. Networking those connections brings this understanding. But networking is more than just a means of getting information about the city. Networking is also a means of understanding and participating in the work God is already doing. It seems to me that one of the ways that we as outsiders need to, um, to function initially, really, and then continually, is in concert with people who are already in those cities, already placed in those cities. You've got to find the body of Christ there. And you have got to buy into that and trust it, learn from it, listen to it, and then ask if there are ways you can enhance that and contribute to that, be a part of that, and so forth. Uh, I think that's tr tremendously important, even if your own agenda is a viable one, in your own eyes or in the eyes of those who sent you, you've still got to be a part of what is. And you can learn a ton, and it'll save you lots of time, lots of anguish. Um, I think it's tremendous. In other words, the people of God are there in the city. God didn't leave the city when the white folks did. Or he doesn't leave the city when people, any more than he left China when the missionaries did. God is there in the city, and he's got his people all over the place. They don't all bear the same denominational tags as we do. They don't always look like we do, but they're there. You know what we have discovered in many of the cities of India and also in large cities around the world is that the body of Christ is divided in the cities. Very often in the village, the Christians will all know each other. There may be one or two churches. The pastors will know each other. And everybody in the village will have a primary relationship with each other. But in the city, very often the churches are standing beside each other or across the street. And many times the Christians feel they're in competition with each other. The body of Christ is divided. Instead of evangelizing, we proselytize. We steal the sheep from one church and take them to another church. And that creates bad feelings in many of the cities. And all of these things are barriers to evangelism in the city. Well, the gospel is working, but it's not certainly not on my time schedule. What I thought we could do in two years has really taken us almost 10. So one of the things I think we have to learn in inner city missions is that we've got to be willing to let God work and, and be aware of what he's doing and, and be patient. The city is, in fact, complex, and there are some very difficult problems there that, that absolutely almost defy a resolution. And it's important that we not go in there thinking that because we are there, either we're going to solve those problems in 60 days, or that because they're not solved and haven't been resolved, therefore God isn't there. God isn't somewhere, uh, just simply not around. And uh, we, we think, as Americans, that we can solve anything fairly quick. If we just give it enough material, enough personnel, uh, enough new, enough technique, technology, whatever. But there are some problems don't yield themselves like that, in particular in the city. Because the city, after all, 
is still people and and groups of people and that that gets sticky and these problems have been long standing problems they've been a building for a long long time and uh, we, we've got to we've got to realize that uh, God doesn't clean up his world in 60 days we have to leave a little bit for a uh, our eschatological perspective even there. God is at work and his work is as diverse as the city is complex. Because it is diverse, because the people he sends are so different from each other, understanding is hard, misunderstanding is easy. And both the city and God's work are complex enough that it is far easier, even with the best intentions, to do harm than good. How people come to the city, how they perceive themselves and how they perceive others already there will often have a determining effect on ministry in the future. As I may have mentioned, it's very important that we understand that God has been at work through his people in the city for many, 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 many years, long before we got there, long before we saw the light. And, and there are veteran people there, not just clergy, but lay persons, almost, almost more than, uh, than clergy. Uh, they really know the city. They're part of the neighborhood. They have a feel for things. They, they're smart, savvy. They've survived. They're, and uh, there's an ethos there, and we've got to feel into that. I'm standing in the courtyard of St. Hyacinth, a Polish Catholic church in an urban neighborhood. In fact, as you can see, I'm standing in front of the World War I Memorial. Therein lies an interesting story of urban ministry history and significance. You see, when the Polish people came to this neighborhood, they were not wanted here in this city. They were vilified by the Protestant establishment. They were not deemed worthy of citizenship. When World War I broke out, these newly arrived Polish citizens found themselves finding a way to earn their right to be Americans. They signed up in large numbers to go back to Europe to fight against the Germans. But that's only part of the story. You see, the Germans had conscripted Polish territories and also Polish soldiers to fight on their side. So people from this parish went back to Europe and ended up killing their relatives, as it were, in order to earn the right to be here as citizens of this country. And that is why the memorial is such a painful and significant experience for Polish parishes in the cities of our country. Why have I brought you here to tell you the story of congregational pain and suffering? Because I believe it might be very significant for alleviating the pain and suffering and mistrust that congregations in this neighborhood and neighborhoods like this experience every week. You see, the ethnic groups that come to the city have unique histories. They are gifts of God. They are part of the flower garden of God's church, the kingdom. They are signs and agents, and yet they don't understand each other. They mistrust each other. They're very suspicious, partly because they don't understand the stories. The last boat people, the Southeast Asians and the Haitians, and before them, of course, the first boat people, the black slaves who came in great numbers to our country and also to our cities, need to be brought together to share the pain of these boat people that will enable us not to take members from one another, but to celebrate each other's gifts and diversities and then reach out to the unreached people all around us in the city. When I came to the city from a evangelical, secure, trusting environment, I didn't have any idea the distrust that you experience in the inner city. People distrust each other in general. They don't trust their neighbors. They don't want them in their house because they're afraid what they may do. So when I came to the city, I began to feel that I was different, that I was white, that I came from a different culture. And I began to realize how much people weren't going to trust me just because of who I am. I was a good person, people should trust me because of that. 
but I realized that they didn't, and I realized that wasn't an expectation that I should have had. People must realize when they come to city ministry that they have to build trust, and that trust is going to take a long time to build. In order to um, allow indigenous leadership to grow, you cannot come in with proposals, large expenditures of money, federal money, and pour it into a community, especially in an inner city. It gets gobbled up as a political football. Very little real help reaches the grassroots people. People that are doing volunteer work can uh, be engulfed and, uh, in such a proposition. When people who are doing a paper program, the money runs out, they run out. And sometimes they inflict a deep and terrible wound upon the community. So if you come, then come without any preconceived ideas and notions of what's good for the black folks, but come to walk, to talk, and to learn upon the people. Learn from the people, lean upon us. Let us teach you. And as we go, with your skills and your expertise, then you would be able to help us to implement programs that might be that might just spin off into a long existing program after you're gone. If you teach me to fish, then I can fish for myself. But if it's always a handout, you're really not helping the poor when you come with these preconceived ideas of what's good. Networking is listening learning, building trust. Networking may occur in many contexts as part of one's personal ministry or in formal settings. One setting is the urban consultation where churches, organizations, agencies and institutions come together to exchange information, vision, experiences and to build relationships. Whatever the context, the goal is the same. Understanding why, where, and how God is already at work for the good of the city. If we were in the countryside, the great spaces separating us would impede our communication. A city permits a conglomeration in space so that we can learn from one another and can be linked to one another. We educate each other. This allows us to establish strategies at diverse levels. There are some churches with great potential and others with potential for development. And the idea would be to bring them into some kind of networking or linkage. What kind of resources does this church have that can help another church? What kind of resources does this community have that could help another community? What capacity does this one have for education that could help another one that does not have the same chances? What mission does this church have that could amplify the vision of another church? What resources do we have in this community that could help another? Thus, I see the possibility here of establishing links. The resource is the capacity for networking. Both trust and understanding are necessary in networking. As much as anything else, the point of initial contact is to build trust. A good example of a trust-building question is one often asked by Dr. Ray Bakke. I wonder if you could tell me the most important lesson you've learned about being a minister in this area since you began. As trust is built, follow-up questions help to develop the understanding necessary for planning and cooperation. Urban neighborhoods are very complex. And as you enter an urban neighborhood and begin to talk to people, you'll see that there are many, many different kinds of ministries and it can be very confusing and you can lose a lot of good information if you don't have some categories to collect the information. Something to help you sort through what you're seeing and help you remember conversations that you've had and resources that are already there. Let me share with you ten kinds of categories that I call file folders. These are categories where I can retrieve information once I've filed it. One of the kinds of uh, categories or questions I'm asking in my mind as I go about the community is, what is the context of this ministry? By that I mean, what is unique in this geographical area, this neighborhood? 
As I look at the buildings, as I see the faces of the people, I'm looking for the kinds of things that are impacting on that community. And then I have some sense of how that ministry I'm looking at is responding to the changes going on in that community. A second kind of question that I have in my mind is, how did that ministry begin? What's its history? Now, in that question, I'm not asking for a chronology for 50 years. I'm asking, where did the vision come from that led this group to do what they're doing? And how did they fail before they succeeded? That is part of what I mean by history. And then, of course, I want to know what the program is. What are they actually doing, and when do they do it? Is it at night or during the week, on the weekends? Uh, what is the actual program, and what does that calendar look like? A fourth question is, how is it organized, or how is it structured? Do they have committees working together? Do they have one uh, structural accountability, a big hierarchy, or is this something integral to the church or to the agency, or is it on the edge? something that a few people are doing on the side. So that's an important category for me. Another category that I ask all the time is, how do they pay for it? Urban ministry is very expensive, and much of it is dependent on outside resources. And perhaps that's not a good thing. But I'm always interested, as I look at a ministry, to say, where would we get the resources to do that? What would it cost? And I think that's an important question that leaders in the city need to be thinking about. Another question that I always have in my mind is, what is the theology of this organization? Now, there are, is a theology that's probably in their doctrinal statement. It may be a verse of scripture that they have organized, at least formally, as the anchor, as it were, or rationale of their work. But there's more to their theology than they're probably telling you in their doctrinal statement. Part of it will be a kind of implicit theology. For example, if all you had were Ephesians, where Jesus Christ is portrayed as being in the heavens, as being the glue that holds the whole universe together, if you built your theology for ministry out of that in the city, you might argue that the best strategies are strategies of working with the structures of the city. Lord of commerce and industry. Jesus is Lord of the politics. He's Lord of the environment because of the Ephesians picture of Jesus. But if you had Philippians, where Jesus leaves the heavenlies and comes down into the street and becomes a person, you might conclude that all ministry in the Philippian model would be one-on-one, -on -one, very interrelational. Now, both are biblical, and in fact, both are side by side. And some ministries have a theology that is more Jesus in the heavens, Lord of all. Some ministries have the model of Jesus in the relational mode. And I'm going to suggest that we look for those and that we celebrate both of those and see where in each model of ministry those uh, theological motifs can be found. Another file folder for me is uh, the audience. Who is this ministry really trying to reach? Are they trying to reach senior citizens? If so, they're probably not reaching very effectively youth. If they're reaching one language group or two, perhaps they've ignored some other ones. And I'm interested in, in that because the city is pluralistic. There's no way for one ministry to reach everybody in this respect. So I'm interested in who they're trying to reach. And I try to file that information because that, of course, always leaves space for other people to come in and reach other audiences. And I can celebrate them this kind of information. Another question I always ask is skills. What has this group learned to do that they know how to do well? Or another way of putting it is, if I were to become a leader in this group, what would I have to learn? What do they have to teach me? And I find that's a good lesson because every ministry in the city has learned something about ministry, something that not only should be shared with me, but should be shared with other people so that the whole body of Christ can be built up, and I find that very helpful. Now, I'm also asking questions about evaluation. Not to be critical, not at all. For example, every ministry has a strength and it has limits. And so one question I ask is, what does this ministry do well or best? For example, a, a, a small automobile or a motorbike can do things that a 
the Queen Mary, a ship on the Atlantic Ocean, or a 747 cannot do. And so I'm asking the question, what does this ministry do? And I celebrate that. At the same time, I ask, what does it leave undone for other groups to do? And my final file folder for collecting information and thinking about it is a futures question. I'm asking myself, what are some possible futures for this ministry? How could it be renewed? Given the changes in the neighborhood, given the possibilities of new needs, new language groups moving into the community, how could this ministry be adapted to the new situation? Right here we are in Cabrini Green. When questions such as these are used in networking, the understanding needed to plan and cooperate can be deepened. I mean, you, you asked me that if you was going to come into a, an area like this to uh, work, my first suggestion would be pray. Pray. My second uh, uh, suggestion would be get to know the political structure. I found out that Chicago is a political city. If you don't know the people's downtown, if you don't know the alderman, if you don't know the precinct captain, if you don't work with those people, they'll cut down everything that you try to do in here. I've had it did to me. And I don't like that because I'm a God-sent man. I'm a God-fearing man. I would like to come in here and see the work need to be did, and I would just like to go on and do the work. But it don't work that way. You have to be political and spiritually, but more spiritually than you are political. Jim, tell me a little bit about your neighborhood. Uh, this is a uh, exciting neighborhood. It's, uh, diversity is probably the most exciting thing about it. We've got over 60 languages spoken in our local high school, and our own congregation uh, has uh, six language groups, plus the English service picks up just a little bit of everybody. You know, I noticed when we were walking down the street that I saw two Russian ladies speak to you three Ethiopians and several Vietnamese people. Is that reflective of your neighborhood and your congregation? Oh yeah, most, most assuredly that. Well, community industry, which I'll refer to in future as CI, uh, came to this part of England, into the south of England in 1971. Uh, it was brought in because there was a terrible situation of unemployment beginning to show its ugly face over the horizon. And uh, the government thought of temporary solutions. And therefore they brought this into being. It, it started mainly for not the, so much the unemployed, but the People are class that were classified as unemployable. Those were uh, people like ex-offenders, illiterates, uh, some handicaps, etc. But it ran into a situation now that it's moved away, far away from the unemployable. It is now for the unemployed youngsters. Uh, some of these girls and boys are rather bright, some are very intelligent. Many of them have achieved certificates, reasonable certificates in school. But because they just can't find a job, they come into this scheme. The core of this project is the vision to transform the pastoral work of the churches. That the churches uh, be not only centers of services, and the people come to receive some services, worship, teachings, and different services, counseling. But besides of that, after that, not instead of that, but first of all, evangelizing communities, reaching out, going to find the people, and also the social action to help the poor people 
and to transform the social structures. More, just, more justice, more fraternal, and more in accordance to the teaching of the Lord. Well, I think there are basic social needs here. One of the things that we try and do is meet those physical and social needs here in this community so that Satan can't distract our people from hearing the gospel. So we're trying to present the Lord Jesus Christ. So we meet those very basic needs of life, whether it's tutoring for the kids or whether it's programs for the seniors or feeding people or sleeping them overnight, whatever it happens to be. Uh, those are the things that we do to try and help folks. And in that, we get our credibility to present the gospel. What are the basic programs of the Henry Martin Institute of Islamic Studies? What is it that you're actually trying to accomplish? The very constitution of the Institute um, lays down very clearly that we are to aid the local church to fulfill their mission towards Muslims. So as you can see, basically it is our job is to help the churches to evangelize the Muslims. To this end, we have three main uh, programs. First of all, research and study to be conducted by the staff. Secondly, publish literature that will be useful for Muslim work. And thirdly, hold uh, dialogue with the Muslims. Well, there is one more thing, I think very important one, that is train uh, workers of different churches who are specifically designated to work among Muslims. Well, the people can, can see that this social or material help is only one aspect of the whole project of the parish. The parish is, first of all, the foundation and the gate is the fundamental evangelization then forming small communities and in the frame of the small communities they study the catechesis for follow-up and discipleship and facing their problems and we have the promoting of the social action we have some many ministries the parish is divided in geographical sectors four zones eight sectors and 60 sub sectors every sub sector is four blocks between 80 and 100 families and we have one layman full-time or half-time in charge of one subsector and visit the houses three and a half days every week the the network model is not is different from the organizational unity model um, and this is a, a key thing about it within a network model if someone feels strongly under a call to do a particular project. There is nothing restricting him or stopping him to it. He doesn't have to get permission from the organization, the denomination, or, or whatever. I think I need to ask you a little more about that particular strategy. I see that you have books that are very clearly Christian. Uh, also, I see some books that are clearly secular. And I'm wondering why you do that. Uh, that's a very interesting question you brought up. Uh, we get criticized for our policy in stocking secular books along with uh, books on theology, etc. But the uh, main reason in uh, uh, which uh, we, the reason why we stock secular books is to make us self-sufficient. Second reason is that those persons who come in to buy secular books are also attracted towards uh, uh, books which we want to promote. So your audience is much larger yes. with a secular market. That's right. You're able to get people to walk into this store off the street, and in the process of doing that, you not only have their rupees uh, to make the store self-sufficient, but also you discover that they are attracted to the Christian literature. That's right. Could you say more about that specifically? Well, uh, out of 80% uh, of uh, customers who are interested in uh, English books, I would say about a very small percent of 2% are really interested in Christian religious books. And out of the 2% who are really interested in Christian religious books, I would say just 1% really buy the Christian religious books. That's because maybe uh, the trend is towards uh, secularization and uh, 
the price of the books is also one of the factors which prevent some of them buying. buying it. You could not then afford to have a bookstore for one percent. Definitely, it would not pay. You would have to have outside funding yes. of some kind. Yes. Uh, I would say that I don't think there is a single Christian bookshop in India which handles only Christian books and is self-sufficient. Well, the parish is in the frame of the cine. Sistema Integral, holistic system. That means that we want to have here all the dimensions of the Christian life, all the dimensions and the aspects of the pastoral work of the church, and all, all the needs of the people. Not only the religious or spiritual needs, but also the material needs. Housing, uh, food, instruction, training for, for, for jobs, and uh, forming a large community all together, solidarity, uh, to face their problems, not only, I repeat, the religious needs, but the whole problems. How has your understanding of the gospel changed or deepened? I think I'd sum up the things I've learned about the gospel here, above all, can be put in those opening words of John's gospel, the word became flesh. I think we've become so wordy, we're not heard. And until the gospel is fleshed and seen and felt and known, it's not received. Which means, I think, that until the Christian church becomes the visual aid it was meant to be, that until preachers become people who embody lifestyles, they're not heard and they're not seen. We've seen uh, in six years a great change here in our community where we've found out that uh, there's six, seven Central American uh, nations represented in the community and as a result of this, uh, these people are really, you know, uh, responding to the gospel when we go and do personal work door to door. They're coming into the church and we've been able to uh, present the gospel and they're experiencing uh, a great change in their lives. They're prospering and their homes are being built together. Uh, there's, go there's been uh, uh, comprehension between men and women and their kids. We are at uh, Uruma Center, that is uh, along the suburbs of uh, Nairobi and uh, within Madare Valley where we have put our new center for development and it's about uh, four kilometers from the city of Nairobi. Who lives in the valley? Madare Valley is uh, composed of uh, poor people totaling to 100,000 and over and uh, most of the people who are dwelling, who are living there are poor uh, and our church is trying to reach them with uh, some help and uh, also reaching them with the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where have these people come from? Well, uh, according to the history of these people, we find that most of them, they came in the early 50s when the, our country was struggling for independence. And some of them are those who are fighting for independence. And later, they had no alternative, they were left here. And that, that's how we, the history of Madare Valley goes to. The people here then are from different parts of the country. Can you tell us something about that, different tribes? The people here come from different tribes, and the majority of them are Kikuyu tribe, which is the biggest tribe within the country of Kenya. We have the Luo tribe, we also have Kambas, a few Maasais, and also Karajin. So it's composed of different uh, tribes of, uh, of uh, this country. There are six of us working here. And we have a very good training program for the staff. Uh, we train them by uh, giving lectures and also uh, by uh, role playing. One of us pretend to be a customer, the other a uh, salesperson, and we go through it and uh, try to find out and criticize each other and then try to find out their best method of selling a book. Secondly, we also allow the staff to take uh, books home to read and bring it back so that they can be uh, aware of the contents of the book and they can 
explain to the customer the details of the book in case the customer asks, what do you feel about this book? And the salesperson can give a first-hand account so that uh, he's be able to successfully sell the book. In order to reach people in the city, uh, to minister to people in the city, uh, you need a concept of having a church along with a community center, such as Circle Community Center. You need to be able to say to people that you care for them, that you are demonstrating and showing concern for their spiritual life and their physical and emotional life. A community center search is circle that is able to deal with uh, their Christian doctors, their Christian lawyers, their Christian counselors, their Christian education program. And we as a church, looking at the spiritual side of it, we can then say to people, we care for you because we can demonstrate concern. In the city, you must be able to earn the right to share Christ with an individual or to talk with them about spiritual matters. And you only earn that if you are able to demonstrate that you really care for a person and their, that you understand their felt needs. So if you have the ability in a combined way, a community center that can demonstrate concern for the felt needs of the people, a church demonstrating concern for the spiritual needs, together you can address the whole person. And that's holistic ministry, addressing the whole person, their physical needs as well as their spiritual needs. And not only uh, do we preach the gospel in the sense that Jesus loves them and cares for them, but we can also deal with their emotional problems the Word of God has answers not only for your emotional pro problems, but even in how to be more progressive in material things too. I believe the gospel has for everything. And as we teach the people to give their talents, to give what they have to the Lord, and to give it out to the ones that are in need, to make disciples, we have seen our community progress, and they can see the hand of God working within their homes, within their relationships, and not only that, but as we see our children picking up also what is taught and what they are seeing with their eyes, and we feel proud where the Lord has blessed us with this place because we feel that our community has a place where they can tell the people we've got a pretty place to fellowship. As you know, we are trying to reach over 100,000 people in the slums of uh, Madare Valley, and uh, Korokosho, it is not easy. We cannot say that all the 100,000 people will be rich at a go, or all of them will come to our church. Our concern is not that church which is built with our hands. Our main concern is to take the command of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel. My hope and my dream is that all of the recreation spaces that are presently available in the public housing buildings could be used for programs for the people that were not paper programs that were not funded, but total Christian input, volunteers working with the people from the community. My dream is that uh, we could even have a storefront centrally located that we wouldn't be jammed with a food pantry in the basement, clothing wardrobe room, a sewing room on the third floor. And if you uh, just go over this house, you'll see that we need more space. That is my dream, to have a facility or a space to have better. These 10 questions generate the interaction that can be an integral part of one's learning and participating with God's work in a city. In addition, the results of networking are numerous and beneficial. Networking paves the way for better understanding among Christians, more cooperation, less duplication of effort, and the creation of ministries which are more appropriate for the actual needs of the community. And it seems to me that one of the gifts that the Christian community could bring to itself, its ecumenical dimension, and certainly one of the gifts that the Christian community could bring to the community at large, the schools, 
the police department, the fire department, those other institutes, city hall. One of the gifts the church could bring to those people is the gift of a listening ear. And that's how we would learn. And in the process of learning, build trust. It's terribly important. Well, I think maybe the idea of connective tissue for the church is something that's very fundamentally part of the gospel because it means that everybody is important and it means that we're meant to be attentive to each other and we're meant to be, in a way, arm in arm with each other. Uh, I, I interpreted that as I started my work in the city as that I would expect to go to every corner, I would expect to listen to every type of person, I would take everybody seriously, and I had no axe to grind. So that when I went to listen to somebody, there was no hidden agenda in my mind. Well, we have found that we aren't the only ones. We aren't the only ones in the neighborhood. We aren't, aren't the only ones on the west side of Chicago. There are many other people, and we need to network and find those people. There are other committed Christians around with the same vision, the same ministry, and we need to find and network with those people, with those organizations. There are Christians in uh, social service organizations that we need to find and come close to. Often, because of the struggles that we experience, we don't get out of the shell of our own ministry, our own concerns, to go out and really find what's out there, the resources that we can tap, the people that we can affect, the friends that we can draw in and challenge with our vision. If we have a vision, our people won't perish. But if we sit in our depression, feel overwhelmed by the problems, feel like we're the only ones to solve it, we'll go nowhere because we don't have a vision and our communities will perish. I'm not the same person as when I started this work. I'm far more knowledgeable about the city but I have a depth of compassion and resonance to what urban ministry really means uh, that, that I sorely needed, but that was given to me. I didn't need to worry. If you will take this procedure of going out and letting the city teach you, you will learn, you will learn all you need to know. If you go with it, your experience of the gospel and you go out into the city and let every kind of person teach you and have no prearranged agenda, I guarantee you that at the end of nine months, you will be very knowledgeable and your heart will have expanded and your sense of need for the gospel and for your fellow Christians will have grown to a dimension that uh, I've never worked on a church staff before. I'm an educator and here I find myself wanting to come to Sunday services with a whole new desire because of the pain I've been exposed to or the courage I've been exposed to or the needs I've been exposed to. So it has a symbiotic relationship between what people are teaching you and what the gospel teaches you. And here I am, I'm well into my 60s, I'm so-called retired, but I'm more alive than I was when I was 30. And I think that's a normal Christian experience. And I think the city is the place to learn about one's fellow human being. You cannot draw up, you can try, but you can't pull up the drawbridge in a city. You've got to react to what's happening to other people. And if you drive around with open eyes, I think we're being pushed into the gospel by the city. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I 
think it's God's burden you pick up. I, I don't think it's our burden. Uh, God's teaching us how to love. But if, if you kind of get into what he's doing and where he's doing it, you pick up that burden. You, you kind of start seeing people like God sees them. You kind of start seeing situations like God sees them. And I think you start picking it up. And it's just a feel for the people and, and their needs. And, and you can almost feel them cry, help. And when you stick around long enough, you start picking it up and you, you start living with it and, and you start identifying with the people here. Thus, it seems to me that the hope of the human race is shaped by what happens in the city. So that the Christian community must not only be a, a community which, which dispenses and diffuses good news, which wages peace, uh, which engages in reconciliation, it also must be the modeling of hope in the city. It must, um, while it bears the burden of the city, uh, it must also find a way uh, to be hope-filled, to be pointing to God's radical alternative, and to find ways to work that into the systems and to the structures and to the relationships, to the way people think about themselves. It's, I think it's frightfully important. If the city is just doomed, if the city is uh, unmanageable, unlivable, um, and it is for many people, the church has got to find a way to infuse that circumstance with hope and then to begin to build around that idea, that possibility, structures of hope. Food, drink, clothing, shelter, whatever it takes to flesh out hope for people on the way to the ultimate fulfillment of that hope. We just can't talk mystically about hope. We've got to uh, concretize it for people. Together, Christians bear the hope of the kingdom, of the new Jerusalem. As a growing proportion of this world's population makes its home in cities, it is increasingly critical that Christians bear witness to this hope in ways that translate into good news for the city. For as God has sought the good of Nineveh, Jerusalem, and Antioch, so he is today seeking the good of New Delhi, London, Cairo, Mexico City, and Nairobi. Let us work together to witness to this good news.